Welcome to the Preservation Association of Lincoln Brown Bag Lecture Series. My name is Eileen Burke, and I'm the coordinator of these brown bags. Today's videotaping is sponsored by the Preservation Association of Lincoln. Our speak we have two speakers today, uh, Robert C. Ripley and Bob Wickersham. Um, Robert is a registered professional architect and fellow of the American Institute of Architects. He recently retired from the Office of the Capitol Commission at the Nebraska State Capitol Building. Bob Wickersham is a former senator and part of the Nebraska Association of Former Legislatures. Their talk today is titled, Capitol Courtyard Restoration, A 10-Year Mission. Please join me in welcoming both Bobs. <laughs> Thank you. I, I guess, uh, uh, come to think of it, that caption is a little bit optimistic. Uh, we started on the courtyards in 2013. This is 2023. There'll be at least 2025. Well, and there was, think. There was interest, anyway. interest by the former legislators long before that. Yeah. So the mission has been ongoing, formally announced 10, 11 years ago. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, the court, the Capitol has four courtyards. I'm sure most of you are familiar with them. This is an aerial, and we cannot get that thing shut off. I don't know why. Uh, these are the courtyards. Uh, the little blue dots in the middle uh, are fountains. Those were not there in 2013. That's when uh, the effort to bring the courtyards up to design standards began. And the first portion of the project was the uh, fountains, those little blue dots. Uh, the, there was grass, you can see the grass was there, you can see the walkways, those things were there, the blue dots were not. So in 2013 we obtained an appropriation of two and a half million dollars uh, to put the uh, courtyards in, to put in the fountains. That had to be supplemented with an additional six hundred thousand dollars, but we did get the uh, fountains in. Uh, I think that finished in time for the uh, sesquicentennial. That's that's correct. Yeah. The goal the goal from the for the former legislators was to have something to celebrate at the Capitol for the state's 150th anniversary, and they and I couldn't argue felt the the appropriate uh, gesture was to put the four uh, fountains in the courtyards that had never been constructed, designed preliminarily but never constructed. So we took those. And I had staff, uh, Tom Casper, and, and eventually uh, Matt Hansen, who are along, who helped put together all the details of taking a preliminary design by the Goodhue office, putting it into final form with the very kind help of our consultants, Barb Vermeer and Hecker Architects, and their sub-consultants to put the package together that ultimately constructed the four fountains. And you're going to hear a lot more about the fountains, but uh, after the fountains were in, uh, and actually, as part of the fountain appropriation, there was an authorization to use monies for the restoration of gardens in the courtyards. Uh, you can see where gardens would have been in this photograph. Uh, those, the gardens were actually installed in 1934 and then allowed to deteriorate. So it's even as, slide. even as, yeah, even as though we were, even while we were thinking about the fountains, we were also thinking about the gardens. But we knew we couldn't get additional state money. Uh, for the f gardens, so the Nebraska Association of Former State Legislators formed a committee. Uh, this is the committee uh, to raise money for the restoration of the gardens. Our objective was to raise $1.4 million, uh, use about uh, 400000 of that for the costs of fundraising, for uh, administrative costs, and the actual installation of the gardens, and that was a it turned out to be a complex project, but about $400,000 for that, and then a million dollars for an endowment uh, to maintain the gardens in what we hope is perpetuity. Uh, because remember, they'd been installed once and then allowed to deteriorate. We thought that was a lesson, that whenever you have budget cuts, you know, that the gardens might be part of those budget cuts, and they're, frankly, they're a little difficult to maintain. Uh, because of their positioning in the capital, uh, so it, it isn't an easy thing to keep them up. But realize too, <coughs> everyone in the room, what is now in the courtyards. Fountains was an effort of the former legislators to convince the current legislature to appropriate the money for the fountains. Once those fountains were in place, 
The next effort was to raise the money and the endowment to install the plants and to maintain them. Again, in come the former legislators for that purpose. So what you enjoy in the courtyards, this central committee here who represents a much larger body are the people that made that happen. Financially, they convinced the legislature for the fountains, and secondly, they went out and raised the money themselves for the $1.4 million it took to install the plants and for the endowment that is now in place to maintain them in perpetuity. Yeah, well, yeah, the endowment will be in place, and that's a story in and of itself, and we'll, we'll talk to you about that. You cannot believe how hard it is to give away a million dollars. I, I, I just don't understand it. Uh, we, had, uh, we had legislation, because we needed a special fund uh, created in the state statutes for, our, for the million dollars. We had legislation introduced three times. Uh, each time it failed, it wouldn't even get out of committee. This year we were successful in getting the legislation passed. So it is our hope uh, that in August, uh, perhaps late August, you will see a picture in the newspaper with uh, a bunch of the committee members you see standing there uh, and maybe a few others grinning like goofy people handing the check for a million dollars to the state of Nebraska. We hope. But you can't believe how difficult it has been to get there. Uh, this is a picture of the gardens in 1934 when they were first installed. Uh, that's to show you, that, first of all, what the gardens looked like at that time, and then secondly, of course, that there is, no, there is not a fountain. This is a sketch of the fountain uh, that was eventually installed. But, but, but Bob, was this good use or did you make this? <coughs> Back up a notch. Back up a notch. Uh, this is an elevation drawing <coughs> taken from the Goodhue office's preliminary drawings. They did not have final drawings. They had a real rough idea of what they, how they were to look, what they were to look like, how the, the basic mechanical systems, and it was real basic, had to be put in place. We simply took that put it into this sketch to give people an idea rather than on a blueprint of what the fountains were to look like, suggesting it might have a little bit of a water running over the edge, but certainly a bubbler in the center. The, the gesture is Goodhue had traveled extensively in desert climates, a great deal in the Middle East and what was known then in the 20s as Persia, and he gained a great respect for how those cultures treated water, and it was very sparingly. The idea of the Trevi Fountain and throwing hundreds of gallons of water in the air only to see them evaporate in a desert climate was craziness. He never produced a fountain of his design that made any such grand gesture. His was always to kind of allude to perhaps an artesian well, which Nebraska has, and have a bubbling source of water that would cascade out of a, out of a fountain. And therefore, the water feature is more subtle than many people, I'm sure, thought it would be, but it also is not as wasteful, and it keeps the water in the fountain, not all over the walks around the fountain. So it's proven to be functionally as well as operationally a very good design. Uh, this is the start of the preparation of the courtyards for the fountains. Now, as part of that preparation, they did remove the old walkways, uh, and uh, you're going to see quite a bit of uh, dirt work. Uh, Bob, do you want to tell them about the material that's being removed here? Absolutely. <clears throat> what you see as broken up slabs were <coughs> originally laid out as red uh, flagstone walks with uh, this checkerboard border. The original checkerboard border were, were uh, pieces of tile taken up from the rotunda of the building that preceded our Goodhue capital of today. The sandstone walks were taken from the public sidewalks that circumscribed the site and then adapted and reused into the courtyards because this was kind of a final little gesture as the project and the building was being completed in 1934. The, the landscaping was really the very last stage of the work to be done and when they were using what materials they had available for that purpose. 
it is all was also very necessary because when we started this project, we come to find out that the elevation of the fountains in each courtyard were at four different elevations depending upon what courtyard you were in. We had to decide what elevation we wanted them to be consistent and we wanted them to be the prominent point in the courtyard. So they were all raised to the elevation where the base of the fountain is the same level as the ground floor elevation in the building and it tended to bring those fountains up so they are in fact more a visual feature in the center of the courtyard versus something that might just kind of be lower and a little bit obscured by plants. Uh, Bob noted that uh, each one of the courtyards had a different elevation. I, I'm not sure that this is what it's attributable to, but uh, the courtyards had debris from the construction of the Capitol buried in them. Uh, and part of the uh, process of excavating and for changing the elevations was to dig up some of that debris. Uh, Matt uh, Hansen is here. One of them I thought was particularly interesting. Uh, there was a piece of stone that had a, an advertisement for a shoe company on it. <laughs> it was, uh, you, ne you never can tell what you're gonna find in a pile of rubble, they, I they guess. They were being efficient uh, with existing materials. Bear in mind also, the capital that preceded our current building had a standalone steam plant on site and it was essentially right across the street from where the current governor's residence is and it was near the south entrance just a little bit west of it had a chimney the whole routine and under, from that steam plant there was an underground steam tunnel that piped steam into the second capital we came across that steam tunnel while we were excavating the location for the southwest courtyard fountain and we had to remove a lot of that. As I say, we should have Matt Hansen up here. He's kind of our de facto in-house archaeologist. He went down, did the photo documentation, got a lot of material and, and pulled out of the ground and saved a good deal that was worth saving of that excavation. And so, yes, there is still a portion of that steam tunnel. We didn't remove it all deliberately. We left part of it under, underground, but where the fountain is was interrupted, completely cleaned out and we have the product that we enjoy when we go to the building today. Anyway, here is more digging, and you're starting to see the uh, site uh, for one of the fountains. Uh, there's pipe, the, the pieces of string are there to locate dead center uh, for the fountain, so you make sure you get them into the correct uh, position. As you can see, there was a little bit of infrastructure put in place originally those are the pipes that you see running underground. They put them in place with the optimistic view that yes, somehow they would be able to put those fountains in place, not knowing that the infrastructure needed for the fountains we would ultimately install would require two or three times the amount of capacity that they put in the ground that you see here. So here's a view of a drill. And it, it, we are core drilling through a three foot thick foundation wall of the courtyards. The fountains are centered in each, and we put in what's called a carrier pipe. We really wanted a man tunnel that you could walk through to go from the basement out underneath the fountains. We created a, a vault under each fountain, a small basement, if you will, and we wanted to be able to kind of walk back and forth to maintain that material because we knew the courtyard <coughs> landscape would be coming. We didn't want to have to tear it up to do any repair. We couldn't afford the man <coughs> tunnel so we put in, I believe, about a 16-inch carrier pipe, plastic <coughs> carrier pipe that runs from that vault under the fountain under the courtyard and through the wall of the courtyard that you're seeing here. We drilled through four times. And so we can put our pipes, our conduits, and anything that need to run from the infrastructure in the basement of the Capitol out to the fountains. And if we need to replace it, we can pull it out of that carrier pipe and slide new in because we can be in the basement and in the vault under the fountain and make those repairs and replacement rather than coming in and having to tear up what we know now is a beautiful landscape. And I think the pipe that you see there was a drain pipe. That correct, across there, that is okay. correct. Here's the and here's our carrier pipe. It doesn't look like much, but it's about a one inch wall thickness and carries a lot of infrastructure from in all four courtyards from the basement of the building where all the infrastructure, the pumps, the filtering system and so on are all in the basement of the Capitol. All that operates it is in the basement. Everything, all the pipes that feed to the fountain
come to this pipe and then into the vault below the fountain to operate it. Okay, and here is a base for one of the fountains being run. You can see it's in a key shape. Uh, the next slide you'll see it is in a key shape. But uh, a great amount of concrete went into this, uh, e the bases for each one of these uh, fountains, not only to hold the fountain, but of course to hold all the infrastructure that makes, the th makes it work. The fountains themselves are a little bit like the age-old tale of a, 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 an iceberg. You see about 10 or 15 percent above the water. In this case, what you see when you walk into the courtyards is 10 to 15 percent of the operation. That's what's visible. The other 85, 90 percent is in the pit through the carrier pipe and sitting in our four filter rooms in the basement of the Capitol. So the heart of the system is completely invisible as it was intended to be. With this one, you can see the pipe in, and then uh, you can see where the fountain's going to go, and then you see the little square uh, where there's an excavation. That's uh, part of the access. Uh, uh, Correct. For control of the fountain. Anything else you want to do? No, I think that's that's it. Okay, and here and the walls, and then here, this big coffer goes on top of the base that you saw. And now we're finally going to get to the structure that the fountain will actually rest <coughs> on. You can see here mm -hmm. that keyhole portion extends in the back of the slide where the orange ladder is propped, and that's so that we could get the access point into the vault under the fountains in a planting bed. I've always considered it very crude construction when you have an access hatch in the middle of a walk and it's as and they would put paving over the top of it as if somehow it would magically disappear it never does and so we left the walks completely untouched and moved the access hatch into a planting bed which you can far better disguise and I don't think many people walk in there noticing that we might have a, a little bit of a void where we have access for maintenance. And then it has to have a lid. This is the top of the concrete pour and this shows the recess in the walking slab. You can see those tiles around the perimeter. This is the pedestal, if you will, that the fountain sits on top of. The fountain sits on anchor bolts which can be adjusted to maintain a level, a completely level uh, fountain top. If you've been to the Capitol and notice that the water cascades over the lip of the fountain that you'll see in a moment, that takes some accuracy. It won't, if you, it's like a plate. You tip it too far one way, all the cascade comes off one side. If you want it to be even, as time goes along, that fountain may do a little adjustment on its own. We have the ability to go in there and readjust it to keep it level for the effect that the fountain provides. The fountains uh, had to be brought in through the north door. These are the big bronze fountains. They had to be brought in through the north door and brought through the corridors. You see the uh, plywood that was put down to protect the floors. But these things weighed about uh, over, they weighed a little under a ton, didn't they? I think it's a little under a ton. They are cast bronze. Three of the four fountains were cast as a single unit, one piece. We had, that's because we have large doors into three of the four courtyards. We had a fourth courtyard that you can only access by way of the cafeteria. That is a much smaller door, and therefore we had to bring one of the fountains in in two pieces. Here you see that two-piece fountain brought in, two pieces, hauled in, and then welded together in the courtyard so we could have let no damage to the interior finishes of the building to put the final and fourth fountain. That is in the southwest courtyard off the cafeteria. And, and just to let you know, the people were paying attention when the fountains were brought in to the Capitol building. I had at least two calls telling me that one of my fountains was broken. We have the good fortune of many sidewalk inspectors. And we're happy when people call in and, and sometimes complain. They say, oh, this looks really terrible and so on. First thing I usually say is, thank you for noticing. The truth is, better people notice and complain. It demonstrates they care, well, 
as opposed to things just happening and they turn a blind eye to it. Well, I love it when people call and have observations to make. I thank them for that and many times they're right. Usually they're only seeing part of the story but... And, and frankly uh, when you look at this uh, you can see where they might have had the conception that it was broken because it's, uh, it's jagged. It isn't just uh, cut in two as you would if you were just going to take a cor torch and cut it. And as I understand it, it was uh, disassembled in this jagged formation so that it had more strength when it was welded together. Uh, somehow this pattern uh, strengthened uh, the ultimate result. Uh, Bob, do you want to, th there's a good picture there of the water symbol. Correct. Do you want to talk about the symbols? They're, they're the at, at kind of cardinal points and midway in between, north, south, east, west, and then northeast, southeast, and so on, there are eight diamond-shaped panels on the perimeter of each fountain's bowl. So when you walk into the fountain, walk into the courtyard, you look at those fountains, whether they're running with a, with a curtain of water coming down the bowl or whether they're, un, or they're not running, there are, these eight panels have symbols, Native American symbols for water. There was not a universal language in the Native culture and Different tribes, different regions of the country had different symbols for water, some of them up for groundwater, some for, for surface water and so on, and they were very and so we tried to pick eight of the most varied symbols to put around the perimeter, and we tried to pick those from tribes and groups of natives that lived in this region of the country, since they didn't recognize state lines, had no such geography, they simply chose what they want, and some tribes shared symbols. Not very common, but it did occur. So we used those symbols from this region and those that were varied in graphic appearance. Uh, here they are, they're preparing to put, the, put it back together. You see another one of the symbols. Uh, you'll see the symbols in the brochure. Uh, here it is, welded back together. They're getting ready to lift it up. There, two fountain halves into one. There's a collar of bronze that, <clears throat> that conceals the concrete pedestal uh, underneath the bowl. Um, and you can see the little tabs on the inside of the dark circle that go into the pit. Those are where the, the stainless steel adjustment bolts are located if we need to change the elevation. They were used to level them to begin with and they remain in place and will in perpetuity. That's why they're of stainless steel and not a lesser material. This was put down in place. I'm not so certain the guy, <laughs> I'm looking for, for Matt Hansen who was omnipresent during the installation of these, of these fountains as well. And for my dear friend and colleague, Roxanne Smith, who was usually the person on the opposite end of the lens of these photographs that you're seeing. So when this goes in place, it's a team project, I assure you. And, and Roxanne and Matt and a huge variety of people in our shops and in the office were involved in getting these fountains put in place, although the contractors are the ones we tried to concentrate on capturing in the moment. And you can tell that this is the bowl that was broken. Uh, you can see it's been welded back together with bronze. You can see the bronze uh, markings. Of the patina has not yet been mm -hmm. reapplied. There it is, sitting, waiting for the next step. And the next step yeah. was a combination. It was tile work, and this shows <clears throat> tile going into the bowls of the fountain. That's Irv Wemhoff. I'm, I'm, we'll, we'll leave it at this point for now. The fellow in the blue shirt in the bowl is a, is a tile setter, their most senior craftsman uh, at Cornusker Tile and Marble here in Lincoln, Irv Wemhoff, who was involved in not only placing all the tile in the bowls of the fountain, but also putting down and resetting all of the tile of the walkways. He oversaw that. He had an, he had an assistant, there were two people doing that, but he took up the material, cleaned them off, new setting beds, put them down. I mean, he, he did that in all four courtyards before the fountain, at kind of simultaneous with the fountains going in place. Then we were able to get the Basatsa tiles into Lincoln they were assembled in smaller pieces with a, in all four courtyards, there's a common tile feature in the bowl. Solid gold tile in gold color at the center, and as it goes to the outer ring, 
it is less and less gold and more and more one of the four colors of the Native American um, uh, four seasonal ring of color, blue, red, yellow, and white. We happen to be at the white. You can see we're at the outer edge of the bowl where the white tiles begin and the, and the white tiles become less as they go toward the center because the gold tile takes prominence. But the gold is consistent with all four courtyards with the separate color at the outer <coughs> ring of each bowl separate to each of the courtyards. The uh, story of the tiles uh, and the adhesive uh, that uh, adheres them to the bowl is, is quite uh, a tale. Uh, Bob and I spent several lunches talking about how uh, we could keep the tile in the bowls because tiles are glass and glass doesn't expand or contra contract with heat as much as bronze does. So you'd have had the base expanding and contracting at a different rate and the, all of our discussions were how do you keep the tiles from popping off. Uh, at various times, I suggested that you heat the bowls so that you don't. <laughs> they, never, round they never cool you know. off. Bob didn't <laughs> like that idea. Uh, I had other ideas. He I didn't. thought the steam might look a little more volcanic. Well, you know, I but, don't know. But, then, but then you wouldn't have had to cover them in the winter. But I, <laughs> this is true. Well, anyway, I, Bob didn't like it, so <laughs> we, we didn't. We didn't do that. But we, go ahead. But we find, But if, but a resolution was finally arrived at. Uh, and if all of you puzzle yourselves a little bit and you think about what some of the most extreme hot and cold temperatures that are known publicly, just give you a clue. It, it's gone now. Uh, all, of the, all of the craft are gone. But think of the spacecraft. Cold, cold, cold in outer space. Very hot as they're re-entering the atmosphere. In fact, in fact uh, part of the tile would burn off. Mm -hmm. So. It, the, the notion was, if you can keep tile on a space shuttle, you ought to be able to keep tile on a piece of bronze. <laughs> True. So, so that's what is you. That's what's in the white bucket is uh, glue that was used to adhere tiles to a space shuttle. It's called an adhesive sealant. And it looks like silicone caulking. It's clear in general and it was laid on and the tile was laid into that and it bonds the tile but it has enough elasticity to allow the bronze in the year-round seasons to change shape while the tile sits above it and all the movement is absorbed within the setting bed that is this adhesive which is a derivative of the space shuttle project and so if you're ever wondering what works really well here on earth <laughs> Go to those who are planning on leaving the planet, and they usually have a good solution. And, there, and of course, there's another problem with the tile. This was taken care of when the design, you can see them being laid in in sheets. There's hardly a flat surface on this mm -hmm. project. So how do you lay flat items on a surface that isn't flat and is in, a, and in addition is circular? Right. So it isn't square. Correct. You, you've got to make all kinds of little adjustments in the shape and the composition of the tiles in order to make that work. Good. And a smiling tile setter when his job is complete. Irv Wemhoff retired after he did this work. Uh, if I'd done something like this in my first year being an architect, I would have retired after the first year. It was a mountain of work. He did a superb bit of work for us. The quality of the work was extremely good and you rely on your most senior craftsman to be able to pull off that kind of, of work. And so I, I admired what he did for us. It was a great gesture and all the tile work and setting work that was done in, this, in all four courtyards was led or done by this one man's hand. So that's, a, that's the Southwest Fountain, the one that had to be welded from two into one piece and that's what they look like without water. It's a little easier to see, to see the tile pattern from that point on. Okay, the, the fountains are in. Uh, the next part is to put in the gardens. And happily, uh, the diagrams and the planting instructions were there for the gardens. Uh, they were designed by Ernst Herminghaus. Uh, I, you're probably familiar with that name. He had several other projects uh, here in Lincoln and was a longtime Lincoln resident. But anyway, the original schematics and plant lists were in, in the Capital Commission's archives, so we didn't have to 
make them up. We didn't have to design new ones. All we had to do was bring out the old designs and ask uh, that they be updated because some of the, while I think most of the plants are still available, mm -hmm. uh, the, the landscape architects said that there were better uh, varieties uh, to get the same plant, uh, but better varieties that were available now. The, the planning list you see here was generally followed. Um, Ernst Trimming House, we, we live on the legacy work that Ernst Trimming House did in this city. Three of his most prominent landscapes are ones that we kind of take for granted, but were really years and years ahead of, them, ahead of themselves in terms of what would happen broadly in society here. A lot of it based on European prototypes. Um, Herminghaus designed Pioneers Park, within which there are three view corridors or vistas designed into the park. That, I don't know of many parks in this region of the country that have such view corridors built into them. It's a, it's a pretty advanced concept. He simply built it into the park. There's a similar view corridor where you're in, in the park and you look through these vistas that are left through the trees. It's like a, a giant 100 foot wide lawnmower went through and mowed down these trees and there's grass with, lined with trees on both sides with the Capitol Tower on the distant skyline. He also did that at Woodshire Residential Park. He designed the entire subdivision, which has small roundabouts in it, Grimsby Lane, Kings Highway, those sorts of things are the roads that go through that subdivision. And there's a park on the west side, and if you stand, stand at the south end, there's a ravine that you can look along, and when the trees are trimmed to a height, you can see the Capitol Tower on the distant skyline from inside that subdivision. Now, you must keep the trees trimmed in order for that view corridor to remain, but he also designed that view corridor into that residential subdivision before the Capitol Tower was built. He kind of laid it out and said, take a look down this ravine, and a couple of years later, there was a tower that appeared at the end of it a couple of miles off. So it was very cleverly done, and of course, Herminghaus did all of the landscape for the Capitol grounds. Uh, if we look at the diagram for just a minute, you can see that there are components to the uh, gardens. The one component is the perimeter that would be along the walls of the Capitol building, actual walls of the Capitol building. Those are all annuals. You can see them on the outside. Then there's a walkway, and then you have the interior design. Next, there are, and, and all this is bordered with privet hedges. One of the modifications was we didn't plant as many privet hedges. He had them uh, uh, spaced close together. Our landscape architect said they'll do just as well if you spread them out a little bit. We did, and I think it works very well. But everything is, is bordered by those privet hedges. Inside the first ring are roses. There's a band of roses on each side, and then grass, and then the next ring in are the petunias or the tulips. Those are the annuals, the tulips in the spring, uh, petunias in the summer and fall. All in all, there are 5,480 petunias or tulips that go into the gardens Next each slide. each year, and whoops, yep. And there are the perennials. There are 3,071 different varieties of those plants. Now, each one of the courtyards will look a little bit different, even though it has the same plants, because they changed the order in which the plants are in the landscape. Uh, I think partly in response to the amount of uh, light that they would receive or be, because remember these are these are interior courtyards and the tower shades the northwest courtyard for example in the morning shades the northeast courtyard in the afternoon afternoon at least for part of the year it, it it's a shifting uh, environment I think it's pretty difficult this is part of the work for the preparation for the gardens. That had, just the preparation had two components. One you had to put in drainage and the other one you had to put in an irrigation system. It's a rather sophisticated, sophisticated irrigation system because remember we've got all kinds of different plants. We have perennials, we have annuals, we have grass, we've got roses, we've got 
you go down the list. Each one of those could have specific watering requirements. So the system is set up with zones and is controlled by a laptop computer. Uh, I don't know who controls the computer, but somebody does. Our, gr our grounds so, people do. So they can, they can manage uh, the watering uh, in the courtyards uh, from wherever they are. But it's a complex system. It took a lot of work to get it in. You just see a little bit of it uh, here. It's one of those wonderful, vague things about landscapes and plants in general, as Eileen Burke, our host, would know all too well. You can put too much water on those plants or you can put not enough, and you don't want them to stand with their feet wet as a general rule. So you got to put the water in, but then you want to get the water away, and I got to tell you, it's a guessing game I fail pretty consistently at. So best to have people who really know what they're doing put in a good irrigation system as well as a good drainage system to manage it. I will, and I don't normally get into the, the, the commercial supplier aspect of talks that we do, but I think our landscape contractor on this project deserves some serious credit. Uh, Campbell's Nursery has done the, all of the work in terms of installing plants in, this, in, in these four courtyards. And it has been done spread out over an enormous length of time because simultaneously we have work going on with regard to the heating, ventilating, and air conditioning system in the building. And part of that bigger project is removal, repair, and reinstallation of windows. Well, when you have a courtyard, as you see at the top of this slide, a courtyard ringed with windows, you can't put that outer band of plants in place between the walk and the building wall. And so Campbell's had to back off, hold their plants, and then wait for us to finish our work before they came in. So I thank Dick Campbell and Campbell's crews for the work that they've done, being patient with simultaneous work going on in the Capitol, as well as John Royster of Big Muddy Workshop, who was very involved in helping guide the design and the updated cultivar of plants that we enjoy today that Ernst Terminghaus didn't have at his fingertips in 1934 when he planted the courtyards. We've tried to take advantage of the improvements in plants, yet be honor uh, Herminghaus's original concept and color type and types of plants that were he put in in the 1930s. Uh, I, I want to second what Bob said. We could not have gotten this project this far along without the cooperation of Dick Campbell and Campbell's Nursery. We signed a contract in 2010. We're going to finish on budget. After now, the passage this, this of, is a, this of a is lot a, this of time. Is a, this is over $300,000 worth of work over six years, and we're going to be on contract. You can't, <laughs> you can't buy that. <laughs> you can't buy that. The other thing I might mention, uh, you know, we noted earlier that the uh, courtyards uh, had been used to deposit rubble. Uh, so we didn't just plant in these courtyards. Each one of them was evaluated and soils were amended, fertilizer was added, uh, whatever materials were needed to bring the soils up to the right uh, composition were added. There's part of the tan stuff is the tan stuff. That's not a technical term, is it? Sure. Tan is. stuff. Anyway, Sub, the tan. We call it subsoil the, irrigation. Yeah, so yeah. you don't see okay. water spraying in the courtyards. It's deposited under where it's needed, and um, it's it's worked pretty effectively for the for the landscape in the courtyards. And the black material is a it's metallic edging. ribbing uh, mm -hmm. that maintains the integrity of each one of the beds. Keeps keeps the grass from growing into your flower beds and vice versa, which is since I don't have a lot of grass growing in my yard, um, not a challenge for me, but it is something that I know occurs in most landscapes. So keeping them separate is a handy feature, and that black edging does just that. Anyway, you see petunias going in, and those are roses getting ready to be planted. And here is one of the courtyard, the, this is the southwest courtyard, with tulips blooming. Uh, and here you can see the effects of the climate. Look at. Three, three quadrants, look at, the, look at the variation in how the quadrants are blooming. Those, those plants were put in at exactly the same time. Although, and, and although not as visible today, notice the 
tulip bed in the lower right. You see there's a bit of a bald spot in there. Well, I told you it's a little less visible today because the plants are more mature. That's our access panel into the vault under the fountains. Oh, and what, and you see the little uh, t t the tan objects in the corners? Those are benches. Those were not in Hermminghouse's uh, uh, plan. But remember, most of the legislators are, former legislators are a little older. We like benches. <laughs> we, we like to be able to sit down. Even uh, those who aren't former legislators like well, to Well, anyway, so there are down. benches. There are benches <laughs> in all the courtyards. Those weren't mm -hmm. part of the original uh, concept, but uh, they were added. Uh, I might note that if you go to the Reagan Library in California, you'll find exactly the same benches. That's just to show we had good taste in this section. <laughs> okay, and here they are putting in some of the perimeter plants. I'm not sure exactly which one this is. Oh, and there's some roses in bloom. The roses, I think, are, are, are gorgeous when they're uh, in season. These are tulips again in the southwest courtyard. A yellow rose. And I'm not sure which courtyard that is, just an example. That's southwest, I think. Okay. The, uh, if you notice a little different, uh, difference in the hue of the tulips, you are sharp-eyed. The tulips in each one of the gardens are different, as are their petunias, at least in, in color. So you get variation in each one of them as you go through. There's a fountain in operation. Bob, you know, that bubbler, now here the bubbler is set at a very modest level in this one, but what, you, it can go up, the we, bubbler can get. The, we, we keep the bubbler usually <laughs> about a foot in height. And um, there's a little bit of a, a, a trick of the eye here. Um, our fountain designer said, well, Bob, I, I understand what you're trying to achieve in this idea of a, of a curtain, a continuous sheet of water coming down from the lip of the bowl I understand so that is a nice effect, but he said that bubbler won't provide sufficient capacity for that continuous fall of water. And if you remember earlier when the you saw a fountain of the t uh, with the tile in place but no water in it, there's a disc about two feet in diameter right around where the stem is for the bubbler. Under Between that disc and the bottom of the bowl, there is a flood of water that exits into the bowl that provides that capacity of water that allows that continuous sheet of water to occur. It's a little bit of a, as I say, trick of the eye. It looks like this bubbler provides enough water for water to run over the lip of the bowl. The reality is there's nowhere near the capacity out of that bubbler to make that happen. So um, our fountain consultant, we said, make it so, and he did. Petunias, roses, and the, the privets today, the beauty of the privets are they, they form a wonderful green line around each of those planting beds. And I didn't truly appreciate how significant they would be to this courtyard design until I saw them not be individual plants, but grow together and be trimmed into a hedge. They really are an impressive piece of punctuation, if you will, in the design of those courtyards. And the landscape is greatly, greatly improved by having that continuous border around the walks in each courtyard. Yeah, the, the, the privet hedges really have added a, a, a great elegant element to the gardens. But uh, I think there is one drawback to them. Look at those tiny little spaces to mow. Uh, any of you have lifted your lawnmower over a 12-inch high privet hedge into a tiny little area, mowed it in about two minutes, and then had to lift your lawnmower out, I feel sorry for the grounds people. We'll, we'll, we'll show you a slide of the people we have to thank <coughs> for that lawn mowing and all that meticulous care in the next slide or two. Okay. There's just another example. There's a tremendous diversity in the plants. Uh, uh, there, we have a plant list if you're interested in that. My wife assured me when I was doing these slides that nobody cared what the plant <laughs> list was. So you have my, I'm gonna blame it on my wife because there's not a plant list in here. And but if you wanna see a plant list, I have one and I can provide that to you. It's, it's, I think it's interesting material, and but the, here. You and can, the beds don't look like individual, um, like large beds with individual small plants in the center of them. They would of course eventually grow together and they 
are looking more and more like that each passing year. But again, these are just a couple of examples of the different kinds of plants uh, that are in the these are the perimeter plants. And our several benches. lilacs. And this is supposed to play. It does. It's coming out of that. I'm hearing it. I'm hearing the sound of the water. <laughs> I don't know that I'm <laughs> seeing it. Here. Where is the thing? <laughs> there it is. Now it's moving. Now it's moving. Yeah, but can you hear it? I don't know. Where's the speaker on this thing? How do you turn up the sound? I must say, go into the courtyards that the sound of the water cascading out of the bowl is a wonderful background noise. You can sit in the four corners of the courtyard and talk, have a private conversation that's never overheard by anyone else in the courtyard because you have that kind of really nice water sound, cool effect water sound in the background. Well, anyway, I think that's what they look like now. I'm going to put this and, right uh, <laughs> if you compare that to 19... 34, 30, here we go, here we go. Now magically these courtyards oh. don't take care of themselves. And here, go back, go, hmm? there they are at work, go back to the one that has the three ladies standing there. Hmm? I'll introduce you to the Capitol Grounds crew. Oh. These ladies really know their stuff. And if you're gonna have a landscape like, like we do at the Capitol, the lady on the left is Heather Dinslogie, who is the overseer of the team that works this out. And Odd, short for Audrey, she's not fond of Audrey, so we, she likes to go by Odd. Odd Cook, who is also very skilled and well-trained. And the lady on the right is Lexis Funk, who is the third member of our team that take care of all of the Capitol grounds within the curb line around the Capitol. And so they are, they are enormously skilled, they are very dedicated, and they do a superb job for the landscape at the Capitol. We once had a, a program that was blended with another agency that took care of landscapes and other buildings adjacent and around the Capitol. Now we have just this team right here dedicated to taking care of just the Capitol grounds. And for our purposes, it has worked out extremely well. These are the ladies to thank. You don't see them, but you see the result of their work, which is why they're there. I don't think we need that. Oh, no, yeah. Here, I, like right. that, I like that picture better because, <laughs> now, well, here. Well, uh, that, you, that, those you, last two slides involve Pal. Oh, so well, we'll, but we'll, we'll get to them. But <laughs> <laughs> you see, we, we, we don't have a script here. No, we, we don't. We don't. <laughs> We're kind of off the cuff. There, but here, I, I, this slide is, I think, very good because it shows how the privet hedges have grown up, matured, been trimmed, and you can see how wonderfully they border uh, the interior gardens. And, and they are even better now because they've had more years to grow. Mature landscapes are something so, you can appreciate more when you see the origin of yeah. them versus what they are today. So go, I, go, another, well, go another slide. There we go. Now this oh, well. is the community, bless their heart, in particular Preservation Association of Lincoln was kind enough to, to acknowledge, kind enough to acknowledge uh, the improvements in the courtyard by the former legislators. And as I said from the start of this presentation, it is the former legislators we have to thank for the fountains being put in place a couple of years later, raising $1.4 million to plant the courtyards and for a million dollar endowment to take care of them. And they are a force to be reckoned with. Well, if you want to get something through the legislature, who better to call on than someone who's been there? And they worked it beautifully, and we have that result today. There's one more thing I want to mention, and it's thanks to the former legislators, a portion of whom you see here receiving the award from PAL for the wonderful improvements that you just saw in the courtyards. The former legislators this last session were very successful in getting this capital endowment put in place. It is something that I must say is in my career at the Capitol perhaps the most lasting achievement that I may see in my 40 years as administrator because the perpetuity of an endowment, the you use just the income off of it 
and the principle remains there and it is an endowment that is set up right now exclusively for maintaining the courtyards. Our hope is that that, that can be expanded into any aspect of preserving the capital in the future and in so doing it is the kind of thing that state government has funds available one year and the next year they do not. The economy goes up, it goes down, but an endowment is there in perpetuity and it will provide that ongoing care that the vagaries of the economy or political decisions can wreak havoc with. This endowment is truly a foil and a beautiful opportunity to see the care of the capital preserved in perpetuity at a level all citizens, whether they're from Nebraska or elsewhere, will truly appreciate and enjoy. So it will live well beyond our lifetime as the capital will, and it's, it's a beautiful thing to have put in place. I'm looking forward to the results that it will produce in the future. Thank you all for being here. Don't you want to tell them about our next project? Of course, I'll let you. <laughs> We're, he, the, uh, as if we were concluding the efforts of the former legislators, Bob said, don't you want to tell them about our next project? Well, if uh, here we do not have any pictures, uh, and I'm going to be a little bit shameless here because, uh, we, <laughs> because may need, we are. We, we may need some help along the road. <laughs> <laughs> and, but here's our next project. Uh, if you go into the Capitol building, uh, there is an area generically known as the fifth floor. If you go into the rotunda and look up, uh, you will see a series of columns immediately under the rotunda dome with the virtues in it. There's a room behind those columns. I can see Carl looking puzzled. He must never have been in there. Well, he's been there. Well, well anyway, <laughs> uh, that room was used uh, for many years, uh, but I think in the 70s or thereabouts, it stopped. Roxanne, when did it stop being used? It hasn't been used for 40 or 50 years. They have offices and things in it yeah. for a while, and then to celebrate the 50th anniversary, it was open as a slave space. Okay. Uh, construction of the in, in 1982. Yep, in the early 80s. Okay. Well, anyway, uh, that space is currently not usable by anybody's definition, because it's open. Uh, you can walk up. There's a guard. There's a railing right uh, that those columns rest on. You can walk up to that, and you can look out, or as inconceivable as this may be, you could throw something out and it would hit the rotunda floor if it didn't hit something else. So you, can't, you obviously it's unusable. You can't do that. You can't have people up there. You couldn't have enough security up there. So yeah, the concept is to uh, put glass panels uh, behind uh, the uh, columns and convert it into an exhibit space uh, with a quadrant. There are four quadrants. I uh, have one quadrant for the legislature uh, one quadrant for the executive branch, one quadrant for the courts, and one quadrant for the Capitol itself. Uh, the uh, Senator Clements introduced a bill uh, this last session and obtained one and a half million dollars for that project. Uh, our early estimates for that project were 3.3 .3 million dollars, uh, but that included exhibits. Uh, so we'll see. Uh, it's probably going to take additional money. Uh, so. We'll, in a couple of years, we, we may be back asking the legislature for additional money, uh, and uh, we'll see how that goes. But always when you're asking for money, it's good to have friends. So <laughs> we hope <laughs> and we, we, hope you'll, we hope you'll remember. Uh, and uh, if we, we feel that atmosphere you, in the room, so we yeah. thought we'd start with our but, friends. And, and as I say, I'm just absolutely shameless. So <laughs> there we go. I've, I've done my pitch for two years down the road. We may need help. Very good. Okay. Thank you all for being here. Are there questions or comments that you'd like to make about what we've talked about? Yes, sir. Well, I've mentioned it to you before. Like I say, my dad worked in the Capitol from like 61 to 65. Uh -huh. And on Saturdays, my sister and I would play around the Capitol. We would go in there. And there was fountains there. Right. My sister, I asked her, and she remembers them too. Uh -huh. We used to, uh, the door that went out to the courtyard, we'd have to pry it open. We could open it, but we had to put a rock because if we went inside, we'd get locked inside mm -hmm. the courtyard. But there was, there was water there, I remember. Yeah, th there was. The, the Capitol custodial crew 
installed a shallow basin there and kind of a residential scale yeah. feature in the middle of the fountain. And those unfortunately didn't have the funding, nor did they have the kind of material quality that was needed and soon fell into disrepair. Yeah. So they, they were well-intentioned and we applaud the effort. They could see what everyone thought was very obvious. They were missing fountains, but they were there for a brief time because they, they simply weren't of the quality of construction it required. I remember one time, supposedly, there was this frog jumping contest, and each governor was having a frog, just like Morrison. <laughs> and I remember looking at this water, thinking, oh, there's going to be the Nebraska jumping frog there. It may be the, may be the <laughs> reptile jumping contest. We're not certain. but. Thank you. We appreciate getting comments from those who were around the Capitol in previous years and what was going on in those locations. We record them. We like to have people recount their experiences there. I remember my experience occurred first in the summer of 1953. I was not very tall. I was barely as tall as these tables, but I can remember the building at the time when the State Historical Society was still in the building. So it is, it is fun to see, and there has been a true evolution over time of what the Capitol's been used for and its level of care and but appreciation. I, I think we're about to get the hook. We are. <laughs> we're pushing up against the hour. Any, any <clears throat> questions, any more comments before I say thank you, thank you, thank you for being here? It's, it's great to have a great, smiling, friendly crowd for Bob to pitch our next project to. <laughs> Okay.